Hello everybody, welcome back to Making Records with Eric Valentine, that's me. Okay, this is um, the first episode in a series of these. I think, you know, as I was organizing the videos, it looks like there's going to be at least 20 of these. They're going to be shorter, but they're these little snippets along the way of me building my dream studio. <laughs> so, uh, we'll, we'll see, uh, see how that goes. Um, there's, you know, some triumphs, there's some, there's some tribulations, there's, you know, some challenges. It's, it's quite a, quite a ride. What I've been telling people is like every, every day in construction, there's, you have the like, oh, moment and the yay moment, like, oh, wow, this is a disaster. And then, yay, we figured out a solution. Like there's always, <laughs> that seems to happen. It's like a roller coaster ride every day. Um, so, uh, so this first episode, there's a handful of videos, and this goes all the way back to September of 2020. So um, in the previous uh, episode where I said I'm, I'm back, um, the, you know, I mentioned that uh, there was this person that made an offer on Barefoot Recording and signed a purchase agreement and then, you know, didn't put down a deposit. But when the when the purchase agreement was signed, I was like, okay, this is going to happen. This person is going to buy this property. This is great. I immediately flew out and because I needed to like archive everything and really prepare to like have that studio go away. And so that's what this was. I, you know, scheduled a time to do it. It was in September of 2020. I went out there, spent two weeks trying to archive every single analog tape in that building and then give them all back to the artists. Um, that was my plan. I just, I didn't want to have to haul them around anymore. And, um, you know, I needed to like just capture them like really good high resolution, you know, transfers of all the tapes, um, do it myself because it's kind of complicated. There's, you know, uh, multiple reels for these masters. They had to be synchronized and synchronized to the original Pro Tools sessions. I wanted it to be done right, so um, so I wanted to take the time to do it myself. That's what I was doing. It was challenging. Like, those tape machines hadn't been used in a, in a long time. I talk about that a lot. There's, you know, trying to get keep the tape machines working. My synchronizers were broken. Like, <laughs> it was, it was an, a total mess, but um, I got through it, figured out how to make it work. Um, so there's that. I talk about uh, baking analog masters. Um, I had to put together a setup for doing that um, to get that done. So you'll see some some details about that um, and the, just the basic setup for for doing it. So here it is. Check it out. So here we are in the control room at Barefoot Recording. You can see the glorious uh, un 60 channel undertone console. There's unfair childs everywhere. Lots of outboard speakers, all that. Um, and so I am in the process of trying to archive um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 180 24 track masters. Um, and I'm finding a lot of them need to be baked. And so um, I have a setup here. Um, this little uh, a dehydrator is being used uh, for, for doing the baking. And um, you can see uh, these just came, came out of the oven. These are old original T-Ride Masters right there. Um, and these are ones that are gonna have to get baked. I'm, I'm finding that um, there's uh, tapes from not that long ago uh, are already getting sticky. There's some um, tapes from early 2000s that, uh, that have to get baked. And so um, I actually just ordered another one of these dehydrators uh, from Am Amazon. So. Um, I'll, I'll be able to try and get through all the baking as quickly as possible. Um, it takes about um, 10 to 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours to bake a two inch master. So um, it takes a good amount of time to do that. So I'm gonna be cranking these, all of these reels along the wall here next to the machine. Those are all gonna go through the dehydrator and then ultimately get transferred. This is a, uh, wild ride trying to get all this to happen um my ampex mm 1200 machine the transport just broke after the first night of doing 16 track transfers so i'm now trying to fix that <laughs> yay um yeah the studer's holding up it, it wasn't working when i first got here and then it decided to start working like these these machines man they're just so old they're, they really either need like a full refurbishing there's the, the scully there um or 
uh, they're just super unreliable, you know, they, they're, they're just limping along at this point. So this is kind of my last chance to really do proper uh, archiving of all these old masters where they're being, you know, played back off of the same uh, machine that they were captured on. So um, it's a really, really accurate representation of what was captured. So that's what's happening. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I, there I also you had a problem. All of my tape machine synchronizers died. The uh, <laughs> the power supplies all went bad in my Adam Smith Zeta 3 synchronizers. So that's um, that's this thing here. So trying to get those working. I think uh, I found uh, it was uh, Kean Kean Reardon, my uh, um, old buddy uh, that start, you know started off here assisting and is now doing all of his own amazing stuff. Um, he has an Adam Smith that he got at one point while he was working here in Studio B. And so when I did an Instagram post, he was the one that, uh, you know, let me know that he was, he was going to be able to rescue me. So, uh, so that, that should show up today. And that up makes it so I can actually do SMPTE locked transfers um, to the computer uh, because a lot of these are more than one reel. I can't just put a reel on and let it play into the computer and then put the other reel on that is supposed to be synchronized with it and let that play into the computer because they'll drift apart. It's totally unusable. Um, and so it's it's difficult to do. And it seems like the, for whatever reason, Pro Tools, they've designed it differently now. It's it's the way it chases SMPTE. It's it wants to see much more stable time code than it used to. It used to be a lot more forgiving because I think it was designed to chase actual tape machines. And now pretty much all SMPTE sources are coming from some sort of digital source. And so they, you know, it doesn't, it's better to have it be more picky to stay really, really locked. But that means that my old masters, when they go, when I try and have Pro Tools chase these old analog masters that have a bunch of, you know, razor blade edits in, in them and stuff, it, the, the computer freaks out and it keeps stopping. And so I need the, the only thing that fixes it is that Adam Smith Zeta three where it reshapes or does a jam sync where it will just keep the time code going totally perfect, fresh time code that is being driven by the time code off the tape. So it syncs to the time code on the tape and then generates a brand new time code that's in sync with it. That's super, super solid that the computer can follow. So um, that seems to be the only device that does it. Um, I tried the, uh, the Brainstorm destripalizer. That thing did not help at all. Not even a little bit. Totally useless for me. But, um, there you go. There's my archiving adventures, uh, today. We'll see, see if I actually pull this off. All right. Okay, so in this next bit, uh, this is a quick little thing about just calibrating the tapes. Um, the uh, importance of doing project tones, what I've heard, you know, everybody always calls them project tones. So it's a, a set of test tones that are recorded that always stay with that particular project because it, it captures how the machine was set up when all those tracks were recorded. And so you can make sure the machine goes back to that and so they'll all be pay, played back correctly. So just go through that, show you, you know, if you've ever been curious about uh, calibrating a Studer 800 tape machine, here you go. <laughs> so I want to share a little bit of this uh, process with you, see what's going on here. Um, I have a, um, a master tape up here, and this, this particular reel is the one that has the, the project tones, the, the tones that are used to make sure that the machine is calibrated exactly the same as when everything was recorded on this project. And so periodically throughout the recording process, I put this thing back up, just check it, make sure that the machine is really calibrated to the same. The tones were printed at the beginning of the process to sort of capture how the machine was set at the time, and you just keep it that way. So now that I'm putting this reel on, in this case, this is um, the tones reel for the first Good Shot record, which was recorded, I think, in 2002. So now, 18 years later, I'm putting this reel on this tape machine. It's the same machine that was used at the time to record it, um, just to make sure everything is calibrated the same. And so uh, I typically put, you know, three or four different test tones on here. It starts off with 1K. And so you can see uh, on the meters here, I think, everything should be at zero. There's a couple of things, 13's a little high. There's a little, little differences here and there. So I go through with this little, little doodad right here and uh, trim all the little calibration pots. Here's the cards down here. And there's a lot of them. <laughs> it just goes on and on and on and on. So, you know, for for each channel on this machine, I believe there's there's four cards. So, 
There's a bias card, there's a record card, there's a playback card, and there's a sync, sync head card. So um, I'm gonna be doing only the repro card. Uh, this project is at 30 ips, 30 inches per second, so I'll be doing the fast speed calibration. There's level, treble, and bass. And so that's what we're doing. And so I just take my little tweaker thing here. This is level for fast speed. And just go and turn it up and down, you know, until it says zero. Hopefully you can see that, see that on channel one there. So there we go, calibrating, trying to get calibrated. So my, this is like my last chance to preserve this stuff forever. So I hope I get it right. In this next clip, um, it's sort of the continued trials and tribulations of me trying to get the tape machine to synchronize with the computer and get all that to work. You know, in the first clip, you saw how tape machines are breaking and synchronizers are breaking. Everything was kind of a disaster. In this one, um, you get to see the, the, the solution. Um, and uh, it was, you know, I just had to think backwards in order to, to get everything to work. Uh, this one is kind of interesting. You actually get to hear some music getting played, albeit through a iPhone, you know, microphone. Um, but, uh, you know, so you get to hear the basic tracks uh, for a good Charlotte song. It was the thing being transferred at the time. And uh, so, so yeah, you get to see the solution uh, for, the, for the whole thing and how I finally got it to work to be able to transfer all those ma masters without any dropouts or problems or, you know, getting everything uh, done, done right. So here you go. You can check that out. So this is the issue when I'm doing all this archiving stuff. Um, I've got my main 24-track machine here. It's a Studer 800 Mark III. Um, I finally got a working synchronizer, thank you, Keaton Reardon. Um, and so the, the problem is that you know, all of these masters, and this particular thing I'm, I'm transferring right now, this is uh, from uh, Good Charlotte, the, um, Young and the Hopeless. So this is My Buddy Valentine, Young and the Hopeless, uh, day, day That I Die. Um, so they're all, all of these songs have two 24-track uh, tapes that sync together um, in order to get all the tracks and so um, normally I'd be able to sync up both my tape machines that tape machine not very happy yeah it died uh, in the first night of archiving in this round so can't do that and also the machine is just really only functions as a 16 track machine I've sort of scavenged all of these uh, audio cards from the last eight channels to get 16 reliable channels happening earlier on. And so, um, you know, it's really, uh, <laughs> it's challenging getting all these tape machines to work at this point. They're just so old, you know, they're very, very tired old machines. Um, so the problem is that I'm transferring everything into the computer 96k 24 bit. I just want to, you know, preserve this stuff, um, you know, as long as as long as I can. It's getting increasingly difficult to keep the tape machines alive and maintain that. So this is the time to do it. And in order for me to have the tracks on this 24 track reel be in sync with the tracks that are were on this 24 track reel, um, they all have to be referenced to the time code that was put down. And this reel. Uh, this is the actual master tape that was edited together um, to create the drum and bass master. So on this first song, My Bloody Valentine, uh, Josh Freeze played the drums and um, played bass to it. And uh, there was some reference guitar and stuff. Most of the reference, most of the final guitars got overdubbed and were done on the other machine. Um, but uh, so this, this reel the band, you know, plays the song a few times um, to try and get the best takes and stuff. And then I actually cut it together with a razor blade. And so you can see as the tape is going by, you'll see at a certain point, I'm not sure where the first edit is, but you'll see some little blue tape go by. Anywhere you see blue tape, that is a place where I cut from one take to another take. There you go, right there little blue tape. There's another one. There's a couple more. <laughs> and some of the edits are actually to take out time. You know, if the, um, in the drum track, if there's a little hesitation or something, I can take out a little sliver of tape 
and make it so the drum performance is always leaning forward and never having a hesitation. Because um, this stuff, a lot of this was played to a click and sometimes the drummer will get excited, lean ahead a little bit, and then they'll have to adjust um, to get back to the click. I take those out. I'll cut out a little sliver of time so the drums, the band is always leaning forward. Okay, so here's the drums and bass playing off of this master tape. I wanna record them in here. So, let's see, there's the problem, right there. I'll get it just like this. So, when these edits roll by, Pro Tools is trying to chase the incoming time code and stay in sync with it. It can read this empty time code and keep the, comp the, the computer in sync with it. So there it is playing along. And when edits go by, let's see if one happens here soon. When there's an edit in the tape, the, the signal uh, of the time code can drop out a little bit. And they change something in the sensitivity of Pro Tools. There it goes. Bam. Stopped recording, stopped doing, stop transferring right there. And so the problem is, is that it keeps stopping whenever there's an edit in the tape and there's a lot of them. And so I can't get the computer to chase the time code. Um, it used to read it fine. I mean, it, you know, uh, th this album was done in 2002. And I think the, the computers were designed better at that time to actually chase time code coming off of a tape machine. And they're a little more forgiving. And now I think all time code sources are usually digital sources. And so the time code doesn't have dropouts. It's all rock solid. And so I think they optimized it to have a tighter tolerance. So the clocking is better or something. I don't know. All I know is that this computer will not chase my time code anymore. It did it in 2002. It won't do it now in 2020. So, so here's the solution. And this is why, um, I don't know if you saw, saw it, but, um, I put up a, a call because my synchronizer, bam, that thing, <laughs> uh, not happy. Uh, that's a very old box with a bunch of very weird proprietary chips in it. Um, I have, th I have three of them. So I'd have backups, all three died. And so, um, I put out the call to get, um, you know, a working Adam Smith Zeta three. It's a synchronizer I use. It's definitely my favorite one. And, uh, and thank you, Kian Reardon, he again, came, came through for me. Um, and so now I can use a synchronizer and I can sync in the other direction. So I'll set up Pro Tools so it's not chasing. Let's see if you can see the screen. I don't have a screen share here. But it's generating time code. Dun, dun, dun. So now it's, it's going to be the master time code. And so here we can, and then we put this on its own internal clock like that. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so it's gonna be generating time code. I have to do a little bit of patching here. Okay, I don't know who that was. Um, so we like this, I wanna make sure. Yeah, so Pro Tools out, the time code's coming out of Pro Tools. It's gonna um, go to the master time code input on on this guy, the Adam Smith. And so I think everything is set here. And so the Adam Smith is going to be controlling the tape machine. And as soon as I get time code going from the Pro Tools session, so I'm going to cue it up. So now we're going to be at the beginning. So we're just a couple seconds into the song. Turn on both of these transports. So now it's going to chase and get the, the tape machine to go where the master time code is. So it's gonna take a second to rewind. And so here it goes. It'll drive the tape machine back to that point. Takes a little second to figure it out. Find a good spot to park it. There it goes, okay. So, so we're ready. Let's arm all these tracks. Okay, I may have to put down the phone for a second here let's see oh. go like go like that for a second 
Uh, okay, so we're going to arm all of these tracks. Do, 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 do. And so everything's ready to go. So as, as soon as the time code starts rolling in the computer, the, t the, uh, the synchronizer will hit play on the tape machine for me, and it's monitoring the two SMPTE time codes, and it's constantly making little adjustments to keep the tape machine perfectly in sync with the computer. The tape machine is way better at chasing the computer than the computer is at chasing the tape machine. At least that's the way it is now. It didn't, didn't used to be that way, <laughs> but uh, that changed. So this is the only way I've been able to get it to work. So we're gonna hit record, here we go. Bam. So there we go, recording. Oop, a little red light, that means we're locked. You can see the two time codes are all matched up there. Let's hear, uh, hear Josh Freeze come thundering in here. So there you go. That's what I'm going to be doing for the next eight or nine days to get all this done. <laughs> so here I go. So there's just one last little clip. This was the setup for transferring all of the uh, two track half inch um, analog masters, all the final mixes for all these different projects over the years. Um, so you get to see that setup. Um, I also kind of walk around and show a bunch of the master tapes that have been done. So this is now uh, September 24th. It was 10 days later. So it was 10 days straight of just <laughs> transferring multi track masters. And we were, you know, moved on to do all of the two track half inch stuff. And, uh, you know, it finally ultimately got done and, and that was it. So here you go, here's the last little bit. All right, so it's, uh, it's been going down. We're transferring like crazy. This is the, the half inch, you know, mix down master setup right here. You can hear something going down right now. That sounds like uh, Persephone's bees. Yeah, instrumental of Walk to the Moon. And so I got my little Lavery Gold converter, just going spitif into the UAD guy and just tra recording right in on a laptop. And, um, you know, transferring all of the, uh, all the half inch masters. So I'm actually done with all of the two inch multi-tracks. It's been insane. It's been uh, 10 days. Yeah, almost 10 days of just transferring multi-track masters and people have been picking up their tapes, so they're, they're not all in here right now, but, you know, so here's, this is all Taking Back Sunday stuff, this is SRC, this is all Good Charlotte, Death Ray, um, Slash just picked up all of his stuff, or his people did. Um, there's uh, a band called Ghetto Blaster right there, the Wombats, Lost Prophets, so. Um, it's all done. All these tapes have been, have been transferred and uh, we got this left to do of the half inch and then everything is totally finished. Right, Alex? Yeah! <laughs> I got it! <laughs> We're doing great. <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, that was, you know, the stuff that I captured when I was in this sort of whirlwind of trying to transfer all the analog stuff. Um, so uh, next week, or whenever the next one, the next episode um, is less less music oriented, more construction oriented. I was just looking at my my list of stuff, clips and stuff, and so it looks like it's going to be um, about roofing, oil, and an airplane hangar door. So <laughs> you have that to look forward to in the next episode. All right, I'll see you then. Bye.